All right, everybody, here's Chris Alley, Alien, about weaponizing cyber psychology. All right, thanks for uh, turning up. We're going to try a little something first, so if it fails, then it fails. We can just have some audio. Too black. Too strong. Yo, Chuck, these dirty drippers are still front on us. So no, we can do this, because we always do this. Ha <laughs> ha. Yeah, boy. Base, how low can you go? Death row. What a brother know once again. Back is the incredible. Rhyme animal, the uncannable. Be public. I always wanted to do that. Um, and Public Enemy couldn't make it. Well, I didn't actually ask them. Um, and we discussed this in the bar. Actually, the point of this, I'm digressing already, and I promised I wouldn't, is that um, if you like that kind of music, then that probably says you're so, sort of bold, energetic, um, very confident, maybe a bit brash, something like that. And if you fall into the category that doesn't like that, well, you know, it kind of depends what other sorts of music you like. But that's kind of the point of our talk here today. It's around um, weaponizing cyber psychology, um, subverting cyber vetting, and really about a Facebook piece of research we did looking at what your Facebook activity says about your personality traits. So. There's three of us here talking today from a small fledgling uh, volunteer organization called the Online Privacy Foundation. It's myself, uh, Ali, and Alien, who I'll introduce as we're, we're going along. So some of you may have seen my talk uh, here at DEF CON last year. Um, my name's Chris Sumner, also known as Suggy, from when I was like about eight years old. And on Twitter, I've got the unfortunate handle that I wish I never had now of the Sugmeister. But, um, I can't really change it. Although I've, now I've got like a, a, almost a two-year-old boy and when he gets a bit older, he's, he's probably gonna be like, Dad, you've gotta change that, it is so lame, or whatever the word for lame is when he's 18. So we're gonna talk about, well, I'm gonna talk, start us off with a quick introduction to personality trait theory. Uh, I believe the US, you know, you guys call it like personality 101 or whatever, the subject is 101. Then gonna introduce us to um, our little Facebook experiment that we, uh, we put together, our research project called the Big Five Experiment. Then gonna bring Ali to the stage who's gonna talk about what she did with our um, statistics, all of the data from that experiment. Um, and then we're gonna get into what the title of the slide is really, um, you know, weaponizing cyber psychology. Yeah, work please. Okay, weaponizing cyber psychology. Um, and that's sort of, sort of the uses and abuses that you can do if you've got, if you're using this sort of information for uh, decisions. And finally, uh, look at subverting or evading uh, folks that might be trying to use personality um, derived through Facebook activity against you. So starting with uh, personality 101, I'll give a, a quick intro as to how I got into sort of psychology and personality in the first place. You see, like a lot of you guys, I was at university doing computer science. And if your university was similar to mine, there were a lot of people that looked a lot like this on your course. And I know before anyone says it, gee, Chris, where did they get that nice photo of you? Um, I, I actually probably didn't even look as good as that. So it occurred to me when I was at university, I learned one very important thing doing computer science is that if you want to meet chicks, then you need to be doing something like person, uh, psychology or art or fashion or something like that. But actually, there's something wrong with this picture. That's better. Hot chicks with hot pizza. Brilliant. Um, <laughs> So, uh, but something curious happened doing psychology. I, I, I went on to do psychology at like adult education after I'd graduated from computer science. And um, it actually turned into a bunch of people that looked exactly like this, except older, including me. And an, another curious thing happened is I didn't meet any girls, but I really enjoyed the subject. So, um, so I digress. As a starter for 10, uh, if we look at psychology in terms of personality traits. It really started in Greece as just about everything seems to. 
uh, with this dude called Theo Thraptus, and I dare anyone to try and say that at 11 o'clock tonight, um, a long time ago. And what he was doing, he was going to parties that looked a lot like this in Greece, because um, they also curiously invented the laser. Um, so some awesome tunes banging there, and he was observing people and, uh, you know, really looking at what drove some people to behave differently to others. So, you know, there's a whole train of personality trait stuff that goes from there through all sorts of philosophers. Um, but if we fast forward a bit to kind of the, the grandfather, if you like, of um, personality traits, it's this dude called Carl Jung. Um, and the book on the right-hand side there is really sort of this seminal piece on psychological types. Um, that was the title of the book, actually. And what he did is he looked at grouping people into certain traits. Obviously, the, the Greeks had done that, and his was kind of an extension from what the Greeks had done. I'm not going to talk about his work too much other than that he strongly influenced these two who were called Myers-Briggs. Myers so actually, it's a mother and daughter team um, Catherine and Isabel, and they were fascinated by Jung's work and looked at how they could apply that in a sort of a practical manner. So they developed really a, a kind of a questionnaire, if you like, of like putting people into certain characteristic slots. So you don't need to know too much about what I'm about to share, but you know, if you just leave here, you know thinking, okay, these are the traits, I can go and read up about them later, and that's kind of fine. So they grouped people into introverts and extroverts. They also split those people into sensors and intuitors, and into folks who are judges, perceivers, and thinkers and feelers. Uh, so they got uh, this kind of... Um, matrix going on, which you could also look at like this. And this is one of the major criticisms of Myers-Briggs, which some of you may have been exposed to in your organizations, corporations, is that it tends to pigeonhole people if it's used incorrectly. So it can be used not incorrectly, but a lot of um, corporate types especially tend to uh, really misinterpret how to use Myers-Briggs and end up categorizing people. So for an example, if we look at just introverts and extroverts, which most people are kind of aware aware about anyway. You've got this um, you've got this neat graph where you've got introverts and extroverts ac across a spectrum, with people high in introversion to the left hand side and people high in extroversion to the right hand side. Uh, what Myers Briggs does, if used incorrectly, is it kind of splits those right down the middle. So you're either introvert or extrovert. It doesn't make any real uh, account for those people who are kind of in the middle. Further, it can change over your lifetime. Um, and I think there was a study that basically cited like something like 24 to 40% of people change personality types in Myers-Briggs. But it's not to be dismissive as, of Myers-Briggs. It's just to say that it can and has been used wrongly um, quite a lot. So when we conducted this experiment, we looked at something called the five-factor model, um, also called OCEAN. Um, and it's called Ocean because it looks at personality traits like openness, conscientiousness, uh, agreeableness, and neuroticism. So let me just explain briefly what those things are so that you'll know what we're talking about when we look at the data. So this is the uh, crazy scientist from Back to the Future. Um, we chose him as representing openness because he's a creative thinker, uh, a, a deep, curious sort of fellow. Um, who's, you know, liable to try lots of different things out in his life in stark contrast to um, somebody who's low in openness. If you don't know who this is, it's the Stepford Wives. They're uh, unlikely to do anything wild and, and wacky, and they're probably the sort of people that go into restaurants and order the same stuff every time they go rather than trying something new. Uh, the next trait is conscientiousness. These um, overachieving, timekeeping people that seem to plague my life um, or you could look at it as the RoboCop dimension, part man, part machine, or cop. Um, RoboCop is task-focused. If you need anything doing, RoboCop is probably your man, um, in contrast to Uncle Book. Um, <laughs> 
Uncle Buck is kind of a scatty sort of dude. Actually, he kind of comes good in the movie. So, it, you know, we could argue that it's not the greatest thing, but I kind of like John Candy, so I wanted to put that in. But, you know, you probably wouldn't leave him, I don't know, with your kids or your laptop or what, whatever of those is more important to you. Um, <laughs> And this, the same could be said about this dude as well, as I was on my personal heroes, Ferris Bueller, who uh, represents extroversion. He's incredibly energetic, social, outgoing, um, really the life and soul of a party. Um, and I think in contrast to uh, Milton from The Office, uh, the office, the office space, my apologies, um, who's probably more interested in staying in and shining his stapler. That's not a euphemism, um, <laughs> than going to parties. I didn't do that in the dry run, actually. Um, then we've got agreeableness, and I chose Forrest Gump because um, Forrest Gump is kind and considerate, you know, a uh, very trusting individual. Um, I mean, there's not many people that had run back into the jungle to pick up Bubba, but uh, Forrest, you could, uh, you know, he's kind of kind, sympathetic sort of dude that would do that and then go and see his folks, in contrast to uh, Gordon Gecko, who is low in agreeableness, uh, greed is good, um, and that is something that also we see and we'll talk a little bit more about in relation to CEOs and what have you. Then the final dimension that we're looking at really is neuroticism. This is Woody Allen. He's sort of an anxious, fretting, worrying sort of dude, um, in contrast to another personal hero. <laughs> it's the dude from The Big Lebowski, and I share something with him, is my love of white Russians. Uh, but he's not going to get easily ruffled, that's for sure. So where are we kind of going with this? Well, the Myers-Briggs, these people here love Myers-Briggs. Um, and most of them, or a lot of them, you know, I don't have too much empirical evidence on how, much, how many of them actually know what they're talking about, but a lot of them don't, but they think that they do. Um, not only that, they use that for pre-employment screening. Um, there's a lot of research out there about how many you know, personality tests use in pre-employment screening and what have you. And now what we're beginning to see is the introduction of something called um, cyber vetting. Okay, so what we've seen um, are companies like this that are, are cropping up, social intelligence, um, HR, they will actually look at your, what's called your net rep or online reputation um, to see whether you're, you know, you're a, a suitable candidate for a role. Actually, I started off being really skeptical about this organization, but the more I've looked at it, I think the more they do a pretty decent job at what they're doing. I'd sooner have these guys looking at my online behavior than having some untrained corporate person um, you know, trying to do that for them because they seem to regulate themselves, uh, you know, a lot better. But uh, anyway, I, dig I digress further. I was flying to uh, Austin in Texas last year and I found myself at the self-help section at uh, the airport, you know, the self-help in the, the bookshop at the airport. Um, I, I'm, is that just me or what? You know, but the, you know, this, anyway, how to improve your life and be on time for stuff. Um, and I picked up this book by a gentleman called Sam Gosling, and he wrote a book called Snoop, and it's about what your stuff says about you, how your rooms and your spaces, what that really says about you. And, um, you know, for example, if you've got a, uh, a, a messy bedroom, for example, you're probably low in conscientiousness. But just because it's neat doesn't mean you're high in conscientiousness. What we'd really have to do is see that being repeated time and time again. So, yeah, you might tidy up your room in some mad spring clean, but then it gets messy again after a few days. That doesn't mean you're high in conscientiousness. But in his book, he alluded to, you know, a, a growing area of research around social media and personality traits. And that's what kind of spired some inspiration and also uh, got me kind of worried because you've got... Um, personality tests that are using um, sort of corporate vetting that pigeonhole people, if you like. You've got corporate types that love to use it, but really are pretty clueless for a lot of them. Um, you've got an explosion in social media, um, and now you've got uh, cyber vetting uh, coming up. So that gave us our, uh, you know, oh crap moment, actually. Now people can tell who I am without actually meeting me. Um, which was, uh, you know, a, a, a bit of a concern. So a friend of mine who I saw co-founded the Online Privacy Foundation with, we're in a pub having a beer and discussing this. Actually, we ended up having a few, uh, quite a few beers. 
Um, and we came up with, you know, let's do this uh, Facebook. We can do this on Facebook. It'd be a good opportunity to learn how to use Facebook. And we came up with the Big Five uh, experiment. Uh, it was a Facebook uh, application that we used that took in uh, as actually over 150 uh, data points made up of 74 Facebook data points, which was, to our knowledge, the largest study uh, of its kind. And we also used something called a linguistic inquiry and word count, which looks at not just the points, but the type of language that you're using in your Facebook activity, your comments, your photo descriptions, your profile, and what have you. And if you're new to this, um, this is a UK uh, election, and they analyzed linguistics from the speakers. And you ended up here with this chap, Nick Clegg, uh, who it says, helpfully, is the most vague. So there you can see linguistics being used in, a, you know, I guess, a practical context. Now, we had a bit of a problem with our application because we wanted to grab quite a bit of data. Here is the application that you probably all love to hate. It's called Farmville, if you can't see it at the back. And this is what it asks for. And that's what we asked for. Um, and we asked people to trust us to handle their information appropriately. So we had a bit of an uphill battle, but we uh, you know, were kind of able to uh, work beyond that through successfully marketing and building trust, and we ended up with a relatively good sample set. However, it turns out my drunken mate and myself, um, actually, I shouldn't have said that, um, didn't have enough information to know what to do with statistics. So we managed to recruit a statistics ninja, although she doesn't like that phrase. So I'd like to welcome uh, Ali B to the podium, please. Big hand for Ali B. This doesn't work, so we just need to do the page up and down thing. Yeah, it's the page up and down. Hello, everyone. I am uh, the resident stats expert with the team. Um, and what I'm going to do for the next 15 minutes or so is talk you through a little bit about what we did with the data that we had, some of the decisions we made about what to do with that data, talk you through the results that we found, and also try and apply this to what it actually means in the real world. So the first thing we had to do, um, we, did this, we had all this data on your Facebook activity and your personality type, and so we needed to come up with some hypotheses um, as to what we thought the data would show us. So our null hypothesis was that there'd be absolutely no relationship between these two things, and our alternative hypothesis was that there would be a correlation or relationship between your personality and your online activity. And so the data, really, we had to get it to show one or the other. So now what I did next, just to familiarize myself with the data, I looked at some of the demographics. So we've got uh, the country of registration where people lived when they registered for Facebook. So as you can see, the vast majority of our participants were from Great Britain or the United States, which probably reflects our exposure in those countries where we fly, where we advertised, um, and where we could get word of mouth going, really. Um, this doesn't actually reflect the Facebook split. I believe the top four countries are the United States, Indonesia, India, and Great Britain in that order. So it's not exactly representative, but this is what we got. In terms of age and sex, over, just over two-thirds of our participants were female, which again is not really reflective of the Facebook population because that's more 50-50 split, um, albeit slightly in favor of the females. But um, this two-to-one ratio has also been found in other studies to do with online personality testing, so perhaps it ref represents a, uh, a tendency in females to be more likely to respond to this kind of study. Um, in terms of age groups, that's pretty much representative of the online Facebook population, so at least we know in terms of age groups we've got a good, good uh, breakup of the data. So before I go on... Unfortunately, I'm going to have to do a little bit of housekeeping with you guys. Um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes is to do with the normal distribution and standard deviations. So apologies if you already know this, but if you don't know it, I'm not going to make sense to you in the next few minutes. So the normal distribution is a pattern of the distribution of data that follows this bell-shaped curve. Um, and one of the characteristics of a normal distribution is that the mean, median, and mode, the three measures of an average, are all the same value. That's this central white line right in the middle, so a normal distribution is actually perfectly symmetrical. Um, and a second 
uh, point is uh, we use a measure called the standard deviation to measure the spread of the information across that bell curve. And a normal distribution um, has a property such that 68% um, of all the values in that uh, distribution fall within one standard deviation of the mean. 95% will fall within two standard deviations, and just over 99% will fall within three standard deviations. And you can see that illustrated here with the different uh, gradient shades of blue. So after figuring out who was in our sample, I then had to take a look at the actual results, the actual data that we got, and figure out how to analyze that. Um, if you're interested, I used this statistical package, SPSS, to do all my analysis. And firstly, I used SPSS to uh, create measures of the mean, median, standard deviation, minimum, maximum values, and also two measures called skewness and kurtosis, which are measures of the actual shape of the data. Um, and then I also created histograms of that data to make sure I could really fully visualize um, what the data looked like. So here's an example. This is the number of posts our sample made in February 2001. Um, and as you can see here, it's a highly skewed distribution. It's absolutely no way this is normally distributed, as opposed to this distribution, which is the uh, personal pronouns that people use in their Facebook posts. Um, and as you can see, this kind of has the potential to satisfy a normal distribution, but we're not quite sure, so we need to do some further tests to find out whether it can be reasonably assumed that it satisfies a normal distribution. So I used SPSS again to calculate Kolmogorov Smirnov tests of normality, which test the data to see if it can be reasonably assumed, assumed that it fits a normal distribution. Unfortunately, with the tests I performed, it showed that none of our data points could be, cons uh, could be considered to be normally distributed. So that was a bit of a bummer. But why, why is this important? Why am I banging on about distributions and normally shaped distributions? Um, it's because when you're doing a correlational analysis, there are two main different types of analysis that you can use. One of them is the Pearson's test, and one of them is the Spearman's test. Now, Pearson's is better. Um, we like Pearson's because it looks at the actual magnitudinal difference between two data points, um, whereas Spearman just has a rank value, so it's just first, second, and third, regardless of the difference between them. Um, so we really want to use Pearson's, but the only problem with that is we can only use Pearson's test on data that is normally distributed um, and that has a linear relationship between two variables. So it was a bit of a bummer that none of our variables were normally distributed, but we do have an exception to the rule in the central limit theorem, which states that with sufficiently large sample sizes, all samples, all samples tend towards the normal distribution. So if we wanted to, we could use that as a kind of get out of jail free card and go ahead and use the Pearson's test. But I ended up not doing that, and there are three main reasons for this. Firstly, um, our Kolmogorov Smirnov tests of normality showed that none of our data was normally distributed, so that kind of reinforced the non-normal nature of them. Um, secondly, we don't know anything about the underlying population. So, for example, I have no idea about the distribution of neuroticism amongst Facebook users, and I'm pretty sure no one else really does either. So if the underlying population isn't normally distributed, I'm not really comfortable in saying that the sample we took was normally distributed. Um, and third and finally, um, with sufficiently large sample sizes, and we had a sample of 537, which in statistical terms is pretty good, um, so with sufficiently large sample sizes, the Spearman's test is only slightly less powerful than the Pearson's. So in this case, I would rather have erred on the side of caution and um, get results that we can actually count on rather than uh, risk using an inappropriate statistical test. So our study was a correlational analysis looking at big five personality traits and our Facebook activity. Now, one thing that's really important to remember with um, correlational studies is that correlation does not necessarily mean causation. For example, there is a very high correlation between ice cream sales and shark attacks, but this doesn't mean that eating ice cream is going to make you get eaten by a shark. It means there's a third variable there, the weather or the temperature, that we haven't measured, um, which affects both of those things. And also, there's not, there could only be one extra variable, or there could be two extra variables, or three extra variables. You can't measure everything, so you can't assume that just because there's a correlation between two things, that that is the, you know, the uh, reason for the increase. So I'm going to talk you a little bit through our results now. 
uh, the statistically significant results of our study indicated that people with higher levels of openness tended to use words more to do with negative emotions and anger, um, and they'd also be more open to talking about potentially taboo subjects like money, religion, and death. Um, they'd also write more about themselves in their bios, and they'd give a lot more information about their hobbies and their interests. Um, opposed to that, people with lower levels of openness um, tend to use shorter sentences and talk a lot less about their family. People with higher levels of conscientiousness tended to be older, they'd use proper words, um, dictionary words, and they'd talk a lot more about their family and use language about, uh, centered around positive emotion and inclusion. Um, conversely, people with lower levels of conscientiousness tended to talk a lot more about death um, tended to swear a lot more and tended to use a lot of angry words and words to do with negative emotion. People with high levels of extroversion tended to have a lot more friends on Facebook. Uh, they tended to post a lot more photos and a lot more comments and they used words to do with friends and friendships and used a lot more words to do with positive emotion and assent. Um, and conversely, they had a lot less books listed on their Facebook page. In terms of agreeableness, our results showed that people with higher levels of agreeableness use a lot longer sentences, um, but they also use non-fluencies like er uh or um, so that could account for the longer sentences. Um, they also tend to be older, they'd have more friends on Facebook, and again, they'd post a lot more photos and comments. And we actually found no uh, negative correlations with agreeableness at all. In terms of neuroticism, people who scored highly in neuroticism tended to post a lot more photo albums. Uh, they tended to have a lot longer posts and they'd swear more. Uh, they'd use uh, words to do with negative emotion, including anxiety, anger, and sadness. And again, we found no negative correlations uh, with neuroticism. So I've talked a lot about stats and statistical significance and what you probably really wanna know is, so what, what does this actually mean in the real world? But unfortunately, to explain this, I do have to go back to the stats. So uh, calculating a correlational analysis in SPSS looks like this. So this is what I get. And this is what's called the p-value. And this refers to our hypotheses. So to remind you, our null hypothesis said that there was no relationship whatsoever between personality and your Facebook activity. And our alternative hypothesis stated that there is a relationship there, whatever that relationship might be. So the p-value states that if the null hypothesis is true, if there is no relationship between these variables, the p-value is the probability that we can obtain a result at least as extreme as the one we found in our study. So basically, it's the probability that the um, null hypothesis is correct. So if it's, how it, if it's as small as it is here, it's less than 0.001%. So we can reasonably say that it's so unlikely that there's no relationship there, we can just discount the null hypothesis and accept that there is a relationship there. Um, but all that tells us is the probability we've made the right decision. But it doesn't tell us anything about the relationship, what that relationship is, or how strong that relationship is. So to figure this out, we need to look at this value, which is the R value, or the correlation coefficient. Now, in statistical analysis, what you really want is a value as close to 1 or as close to minus 1 as you can possibly get, because this indicates a really strong relationship. So already, intuitively, you can see here, although it's highly statistically significant, the number itself is only 0.24, which you can already tell it's maybe not that strong. So what we need to do with this value is square it, and that will give us our correlation, our coefficient of determination, which is the percentage of variance or fluctuation in one variable that can be explained by the other variable. So if we square this number, you get approximately 0.05, and that translates to... a 5%. So 5% um, of a person's extroversion can be determined by how many friends they have on Facebook. Um, so in a nutshell, statistical significance uh, indicates that we're valid in stating there is a relationship there, but it doesn't indicate the strength of that relationship. And the result can be highly statistically significant, but can only explain a very small amount of variance in the data. And that's me done. So with that, I shall hand back to Chris. So um, Ali explained this to me uh, again in a bar, and I was like, well, you know, I, I can see your lips moving, but I just can't understand a word you just said. 
Um, so we applied it to Vega strategy, and basically what we're saying is that the results will give you an edge, but not a massive edge. Um, or stated another way, if you want to make an educated bet and a highlighted bet, then you'd be crazy to bet against those odds. So, you know, the point is that, yeah, it does show relationship, but of what practical significance is there? And that was, I guess, one of the titles we looked at for the talk, but since it was DEF CON, it was like, ah, practical significance, who's gonna turn up? Let's call it weaponizing. Um, so, um, one of the things we've looked at, once you can determine or have an educated guess about people's personality traits, is so there are studies, for example, that show uh, links or correlations between um, people with high openness and their susceptibility to um, uh, online marketing. In fact, on the plane uh, over here, there was a guy I was chatting to who was talking about the use of color in images to get certain demographics uh, click, you know, clicking on particular links. So that was pretty interesting, but there are studies that show this. So if you're an advertiser um, and the consequences aren't so bad, then you know, determining people who have got high, um, higher openness, you may want to target your ads at them more than people who have got lower openness. Uh, and if you want to see something pretty neat, if you go to we feel fine, uh, dot org, you can see this used in kind of a sentiment analysis of people's blogs and tweets and stuff like that. And it, it's really pretty neat and it's worth going and having a look at it for. But, you know, um, as we have discussions in pubs, um, kind of turn to looking at, well, what could you do with uh, online dating? So, for example, if you were looking at a potential mate's um, Facebook page, you might be able to determine you know, whether there's a slight chance that they may be uh, slightly more high maintenance, for example, or somewhat more promiscuous. In fact, there's uh, a book that Sam Gosling references in his book Snoop uh, called The Rachel Papers by Martin Amis, where the central character of that kind of adapts his personality and what have you to, uh, to get the girl. Um, so this could, you know, th this could work well in theory until you uh, actually try and apply it and actually meet the person in real life. Um, and there's a, a kind of a dating rule that's well known is that you can only really date between uh, plus or minus two of your, you know, your potential match unless you've got something to trade with, like, uh, you know, a large bank account status or, you know, something, something like that. So unfortunately, in this case, you... Um, <laughs> You're not going to get too far, um, but if you don't intend to meet them and you're conducting, say, a romance scam, for example, then uh, it could be quite useful to you because you're not using your own picture anyway. Um, so, you know, looking at this, we're also, okay, well, what other studies are there that are out there? What other information is out there? And now uh, agreeableness um, is associated with gullibility as well. So let's say you're conducting uh, some social engineering. Uh, maybe you're using your favorite tool for trawling through a, a, a wide range of you know, sort of social network profiles, maybe Montego, if anyone sort of taught last year. It might be useful to know who the people who are more agreeable in a group are and target them first. Um, because they're likely to be somewhat more gullible than the others. And I guess the key point is remember that this is a bet. It doesn't mean they are going to be more agreeable. It means that you've got a slight edge over just selecting people at random. So in terms of social engineering, it's a useful tool for a social engineer's toolkit, um, I guess, unless you're Kevin Mitnick and you, you know, it's kind of hardwired into you. Um, so I don't know if anyone saw, I guess you all did, the HB Gary stuff earlier this year. Well, there was, um, you know, there was a lot of articles written about that. And this term came up, sock puppets, which I'd never really heard of before. But it's essentially um, the practice of um, having fake personas, lots of fake personas on social network sites and having them do all sorts of, you know, fun things. And to really explain what some of those fun things are, here's something I really recommend going and checking out on Google. Um, it's by a, a guy called Tim Huang, uh, who conducted uh, a competition called Social Bots 2011, where they had teams, uh, kind of like capture the flag, going, uh, basically controlling these sock puppets that they'd created on, on Twitter. 
uh, and going after unsuspecting Twitter users, trying to make them do things they wouldn't ordinarily do, and they'd score points for that. It's a five-minute video, uh, and it's well worth checking out. Um, so I guess I'll be doing that, uh, that next year, too. So uh, with that, I'm going to introduce Alien uh, to the podium to talk about subverting and evading. <clears throat> so hi there, as you can see, I'm a goon. Uh, I co-run DEF CON London with uh, Major Malfunction. Uh, I also run 44Con, a thing that's happening in London later this year. Um, so why did I get involved? Well, really subverting and evading, you know, as examples of manipulation are really quite interesting. I've done it using in social engineering um, on a couple of jobs. And when I saw that the press was starting to get involved and they come up with crass statements like this that are just wrong, um, I start to worry. Um, not just the uh, Washington Post, um, ABC were at it as well. Um, if they're coming to this conclusion that you can use Facebook as a personality test, well, you've seen from Ali's data, it gives you a slight edge, but you really cannot rely on it. Um, so if they're looking at things like openness, one thing that's linked to openness is drug use. So you're going for an interview, that they think you're open, they're going to put you in the pocket of the ooh, possible drug users. Well, that's just not right. The other issue is that they go into a bit more detail, and it's not just openness. You end up with narcissism, psychopathy, and machiavellianism, which are known as the dark triad. Now, if you've got the CEO of a company, these are the traits of a CEO. This is why you're not CEOs, guys. <laughs> you're just too open. <laughs> so, um, you want to subvert this. So, the first thing is you've got to know your enemy. Um, you start trying to play with your personality types willy-nilly, and it could get a bit messy. So there's one really quite easy thing you could do. Just don't do social networking. I mean, it's not hard, right? <laughs> now, you think this would be a common thing, but I actually only know a few people that aren't really involved with social networking. And one of them's actually on Twitter, which they don't class as social networking. Huh? And the other one is on LinkedIn. Oh. So, <laughs> you know, the Facebook for businessmen. Um, it also leads to trouble. You generally link your online activity to your job or to real life activities. If you play the job of, say, one email address for friends and one email address for family, that's great until you marry someone that was a friend and they use the wrong email address when replying to your mother. It's tricky to separate your life. And I'm one example of this. I've used the online Nick alien since 1982. I'm running a conference in the press release we want businessmen at the conference. Could I use my Nick Alien? No. So next year, if you look on the DEF CON helping thing, I'm probably the only goon there using my Nick. Next year, I'll be using my real name. So you want to dick with this subverting, this uh, personality thing. Let's play with language. So we were drinking some Guinness stuff. And I said, well, how about, you know, we all know how good Google Translate is and Babel Fish. Let's translate our data that's going into the social networking side, put it through that, wrap it through a few languages, and pop it out again, because, you know, that leads to gobbledygook. Well, <laughs> it did work, but a swear word in English, actually, when you translate it, is still a swear word in French. And part of the lexical analysis was looking at swear words in all languages, so we're screwed. Don't waste your time. It's dead easy to script, but just don't bother. So, tweaking your personality. <laughs> you can link desirable personality traits to a particular type of job. So you've got openness here that is quite a large range of acceptable values. 
Um, I think you've got extrovertism that's actually a much narrower range. Now, this is great, but how do you know what to say that would influence these values? And um, with a bit more Guinness, we actually came up with this. How about if we wrote an app that you put your status message uh, that you want to actually do, you then tweak the sliders, so I want this really open or really extrovertism, and then we pop out the status message afterwards. Now that would be really cool. So if you're gonna go away and write this, um, Creative Commons, please, there's the license. And second, we need a copy because we've got to give it to Ali because she, we've actually got to work out whether your correlation of this data is correct. And as you've seen, that's not necessarily trivial. So the last possible thing that we could really think of is, um, let's play with some pills. Um, psychotropics, yeah. Um, great fun. A lot of research has happened in Russia and Eastern Europe, not so much in the Western world, um, uh, except for things like Prozac. The, the problem with something like Prozac is your base level that you start at is very variable because Prozac is thrown out like Smarties, it seems. Um, so you're not going to end up with a nice correlated set of results and Ali will chew your ass, so yeah, forget it. And it's now back to Chris. Thank you. So I'll get us, uh, get us wrapped up here. I guess the, the area there of looking at uh, mental health in particular and um, you know, the correlations to Facebook activity is somewhere, something that has not had, um, as far as I can tell, any research and I think would be a very interesting project to, uh, to work through. So where are we kind of going with this? Well, here's the thing that really concerned me is that you know, you're, you're on social networks, um, you know, maybe you are in college, your digital stuff lasts forever. I know if I had um, you know, my pictures and activity from Facebook when I was 18, uh, I probably wouldn't be in employment now. Um, and you know, it doesn't get spent, it's always there. So if people are gonna be trawling that, then um, you know, we've got a problem, especially if they're gonna be trawling that and jumping to incorrect conclusions. So what we're not saying is that there is no link here between Facebook and personality. What we're hoping the message is, is that yes, there is a link, but don't use it on its own for basing critical decisions. So, you know, we thought about it very briefly. What can you do here is, okay, cyber vetting, you could probably apply some regulatory control and we all know how well PCI has worked. So um, I'm not sure that that would work particularly well in cyber vetting. Plus, um, if I'm told don't go and take a look at somebody's um, social media uh, profile or online reputation, uh, as a manager, I just say, okay, I won't, and then I'll go and do it anyway. I'm, I'm not a manager, but you know, there you go. That's the, the kind of thing that could happen. What would appeal for folks, though, is really to sort of embrace people's differences. Um, you know, the edges are where the really cool stuff happens. So, you know, kind of being a bit more uh, open to people's differences. And the final thing, I guess, you know, for, for you guys really is that where you see these statistics in the newspaper saying that Facebook can reveal your personality, um, question and challenge what it says because those articles stem from a piece of research that did not say that this can be used in this context. The newspapers grasped onto that. So question and challenge uh, everything where you see statistics. Um, so we've looked at We've looked at an intro to personality, hopefully very briefly. We told you about our Facebook app. Ali told you how, about statistics and blew my mind. Uh, we talked about briefly, you know, how you can use that information for good and for bad, possibly. We talked about how you might hide it, you know, hide from it. Uh, and then we talked about kind of what you can do. So this really kind of concludes our talk almost. Uh, just want to bring Alien to the podium for one final uh, comment before we wrap up. Okay, so this one's uh, kind of personal. Um, you've probably heard about Barcode. Um, he's got a pretty nasty disease. His bone marrow is screwed. It's killing his red blood cells. He's, having, he's basically living on transfusions. So if you're a US citizen, 
Uh, your last chance to give blood is 1900 today. Um, please, please do it. The second thing is, again, if you're a US citizen, please go to the contest area and get tested for your bone marrow because that's the only hope of really curing what he's got. Uh, the reason we can't do it, by the way, is us Brits have all got mad cow disease. Um, so don't ping him with emails, Twitter, etc. Look at barcodestatus.tumblr.com. And uh, if all this isn't a good enough reason to do it, Priest says do it, so damn well do it. Thank you. Thanks very much.